it numbs you a nightmare a horrible disease these are just a few of the ways people have described mental illness in their lives whether it's you your child or a friend mental illness impacts all of us in the same ways and that's why the mind space podcast is committed to uncovering mental illness and the impact it has thank you very much for joining us on the mind space podcast i am fahad bin muhammad your host today and with me today i have my lovely guest eva my newfound friend and we're going to be talking about adhd and dyslexia a condition which she suffers with but us on the African continent, I don't believe we're well versed with it. So we're going to traverse how she's managed to cope with it and the challenges she's faced along the way to this miraculous stage that she's at right now. So Eva, thank you very much for honoring us and being on this show. Thank you for inviting me. Okay, so briefly tell the people what you're about. As in, in terms of dyslexia or in terms of me as well, a human as being? Human. <laughs> Minus the, the attachment to dyslexia. Right. Yeah. Um, I am Ugandan by heritage, or I guess that's what you would say. So my parents were both born here, um, and I was born in Australia. So I grew up in Australia. Uh, I do a lot of creative stuff, website design, graphic design, TV production, all of the things, all of the things. Radio, I was a radio host for a long period of time and been basically working in music. Uh, About four years ago, I started the process of adopting, well, looking after and adopting four children. And that's what brought me back to Uganda. Children. Yeah, because um, I was living in Australia and then flying over twice a year. Yeah. So they would have a part-time mom or holiday mom yeah. as I was. And um, when COVID came, Australia has still locked down the borders. Yeah. So I had to apply to the government to get out and come be with my babies. And they let you here. Yeah, eventually they yeah. said yes. And, um, and so, yeah, so I've been here since November of last year. That's kind of me in a nutshell. So you, you're new to the country? New ish. Yeah. Sense of yeah. This is the longest I've been in Uganda. Yeah. I was here when I was 15. I went to um, King's College Budo for six months. Caused, caused ruckus and went home. <laughs> 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 I actually wanted to stay because I liked it. Yeah. But um, my parents were like, Mm-mm. they weren't having it. Uh uh-uh, uh. No. We're going to get back to your children actually. Mm-hmm. I think that's also another whole issue to talk yeah. about. Yeah. But so briefly, I think we should describe what dyslexia is and ADHD. Um, Well, I can tell you kind of what I've had to, because I was diagnosed with ADHD, well, ADD, really, um, about five years, six years ago. So attention deficiency disorder. Attention deficit disorder, yeah. Yeah. So um, that was, so... The adult form, which I would have had, like I had all the signs when I was a kid, but just wasn't my, I mean, my parents are still African. Just because you go to Australia doesn't mean you're like automatically become, right? They're like, ah, this one, she's just a problem. But uh, I had, I had um, a lot of concentration issues. So um, ADD is your, your mind goes very fast, like super speed, but it means that you, it's sometimes very hard to concentrate. Like I get very easily distracted. Yeah. So if there's a lot of noise around and stuff like that, sometimes it's kind of overwhelming for me and I just have to sit back or yeah. find a room and, and hide for a little bit. Yeah. But I like, like I like that stuff as well. I find it very exciting and very stimulating, but sometimes it's overstimulating. Um, and so that means that if, I, if I'm really not concentrated on something, Um, to force myself to concentrate is actually a very hard feat but there's a thing that and I I don't think that I suffer from any of these things and it's some it's a journey that I had to go on because like obviously you especially when they're trying to figure out what's up you know you get all these labels they're like oh you have this and you have depression and you have blah 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 and you have you know because all of these mental illnesses have their adverse effects can look like each other, yeah. yeah, you know what I mean? And so they, I didn't, in the beginning, I didn't like terms. I didn't. You didn't you like know, being labeled. I didn't like being labeled, yeah. right? But then. What's the beginning? Because you see now we have two conditions. Yeah. The ADHD, the ADD was yeah. six years ago. Yeah. Then the dyslexia. 
Uh, dyslexia, I kind of knew from um, probably my adult years. Uh, I didn't know it when I was growing up. Uh, they just said that I had trouble spelling. So dyslexia is you switch, you flip things, right? So you don't it's see things. Disorder. Yeah, it's... I, but, okay, I really, that's, that's what it's coined as. It's, it's, it's coined, coined as, as, that. A, as a learning deficiency. Yes, yeah. it is. It's coined as a learning deficiency, which I really think that people should edge away from because, well, like I think it's one in four billionaire, um, millionaires or billionaires are dyslexic. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. actually not a learning deficiency or a learning disorder. It's a differentiated learning style. Yes, you don't right? learn the way we learn in our right. convoluted world. Right. Yeah. yeah. So you usually have teachers that will teach you this way and, and, and a lot of teachers don't pick it up. Mm. So you can't have a kid that knows all of the working out to a math problem but when it gets to the second last line they flip the numbers and still continue to work it out right but it's obviously going to be the wrong you know yeah. and so you got a lot of these terms of careless she's a little bit careless yeah. she doesn't have attention to details yeah. she, that kind of stuff but really it was like i would miss a letter here or i'd misspell this or i'd like never spell there's some words in my vocabulary i've got a very large vocabulary yeah. but it is what it is. Yeah, I can't spell them. Do you know yeah. what I mean? And and a lot of the time, like, people get really frustrated with me in texting because, obviously, you're you're also going very fast and you're yeah. doing a lot of things. And so there's spelling, mis- Ooh, there's, there's spelling mistakes all the way yeah. through my text messages. And um, and people were like, does this does this chick even know English? And it's like, yeah, I do. It's yeah, just, yeah. you know. But you, you also... I think that when you are told that you are not smart, it's actually very detrimental because yeah. I'm actually, I'm very intelligent, very, very, yeah, very no, intelligent. No, 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 yeah. And, um, and the one thing, the flip side that, um, people don't really see with dyslexia, um, and ADD is that you are able to do things in a very different way. So if I'm very concentrated on something, I can get something done in, two seconds yeah. do you know what i mean which would take someone a whole day yeah. you know and sometimes people see like i might not be concentrating or i might be looking out the window but my head is figuring yeah. out the solution so it looks like oh she just took a nap yeah, but out, yeah. right but um then then the thing gets done in two seconds and then they're like what well, how did you do that so quickly yeah. and the same thing with dyslexia is with dyslexia um and the interesting thing is, is that a lot of, like, I think it's like three in 10 people that have ADD also have dyslexia. Yeah. Like they're very, you know. It's but, interrelated. Yeah. It's, that just tends to be, yeah. yeah. Um, but with, um, with dyslexia, you see patterns that people don't see, yeah. you know. So if I have a meeting, and that's why a lot of, like, clients like working with me in terms of graphic design or branding or whatever, because I'll, I will, I see things in maps. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so I'm like, if we do this here, we can connect that to there and then we can tie this in here and then we can and then we can thread that through there. And people don't see that. They're like, oh, we have, we've done social media posts, yeah. but how does that go onto your YouTube or how does that connect to your, you know, so they don't you, see you, the... I think you attribute that skill to the form of education no. you attained? No, no. Was it... You attain the same form of education, the writing, the... Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's not... I, I didn't actually realize that I had these th- these kind of abilities until I got out of uh, the generic schooling. Mm. And that's a problem, like... So another one of the things that I do is I'm a learning designer. Mm. So I got into that because I like graphics and stuff like that. Mm. And then when you're doing learning, it's amazing how you can see those patterns and tie everything yeah. in, right? And so they are now getting into the stage of trying to have differentiating learning styles, which is not all kids will see and understand things in words. So you can't stand, we call it chalk and talk, yeah. right? You write on a blackboard, you talk to the people and they're supposed to get it. Now you're like, well, if they don't get it like that, maybe you can do it in pictures. Why does it have to be two plus two? Why can't it be two oranges and two oranges? Why can't it be, you know, like, so you then start having these teachers who are able to 
get an idea across to students in multiple ways through song, through art, through, you know, um, because one of the hard things is, is that with dyslexia and ADD, there's certain things that I can't read. If you give me a whole textbook, I usually find it very difficult to sit there and read it. Yeah. Audio books, go for gold. Do you know what I mean? And, and the, the fact with like my brain is that I retain so much of that information, you know, Mm -hmm. like I can have a conversation on pretty much anything. (laughs) My research about dyslexics, I think uh, the visual and the auditory yes, really, really up there. Yes. Yes. So I'm actually tend to have photogenic memory, photographic memory. Yeah. So did you ever incorporate that? Cause when you say, the ordinary learning system. Yeah. This is you in Australia. Yes. Not you in Uganda. But I've also experienced both. In Uganda. And they were very yeah. similar. So one of the contrast is that form of education, the visual, the it's kind of special needs, but the, no, not in a way, which mm. works for everyone. Mm. But that is more or less in a developed setting. Yeah. So if they could not detect your condition in a developed setting, did it take them a while or no well with the dyslexia i just figured that out by myself yourself yeah with the dyslexia i figured it out myself with the add it's like you these if you don't have um severe like severe yeah symptoms. Yeah, symptoms you can just be seen as a naughty child yeah or, or an overactive child or she's just loud or she just butts in in conversations yeah. you know like i've had to teach myself how to um listen and pull back because part of the ADD thing if if I get excited I'll talk over people yeah. like straight up interrupt rudely you know what I mean and yeah. so I I have to notice in social situations but that's the great thing about dyslexia is that you're hyper aware of <laughs> social yeah. situations that I sometimes have to force myself to take a breath and then listen because I can get so excited about an idea that I don't listen to what someone's saying, yeah. you know? And so I'm one of those, and maybe this is just a personality trait, but I've always been one of those people, if there's a problem, I want to figure out how to fix it. So if I'm like, if someone's like, oh my God, you're so sensitive, which I am, like I'm hyper, hypersensitive. I, my feelings get hurt very easily. Like you will find me reading audiobooks mm-hmm. on how you know like listening to audiobooks yeah. like researching whatever to find out what is the best way and what are the skills but i think the most important thing if anyone like has things like add because they're not add is not a mental illness so it's different from your depressions it's different from they actually put it more on the asperger spectrum yeah. where it's like your brain just is different it's not backfiring it's just different right just the attention span right the attention attention it's but it's more than that because you can't you can't boil it down to attention span Mm. because if i'm uh really intrigued with something you can't get me off it so like there was a, a a lot of time that i was an artist and that's why people like how do you do so many things it's like you're a radio present like even my CV should say that I have, just should show ADD on it. It's like, oh, you're a radio presenter? Oh, you had your own magazine? Oh, you did website design? You're like, it's all over the shop, right? It's like controlled mania. Huh? Controlled yes. Mania. Sometimes it's not when, controlled. Let's okay, be fair. So <laughs> Let's be fair. Yeah. But, you know, like, I, but I will get obsessed with something. Fixation. And, yeah, and you get fixated. Like, yeah. And that's part of ADD. Yeah. Which, like, if... Um, the the problems that i've had with that socially is that i get i can get fixated on an idea and then i find it hard to let go is it just ideas or people as well because i believe with the condition mm. my research there also there's an attachment issue there's the easily getting attached to things bonding with very many elements it doesn't have to be music it can yeah be people it can be places it can yes. be I mean repetitive habits. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I if if something makes me feel good, just know that you're going back from hundred percent. But then that, that also leads to like, you know, drinking problems, smoking. We're, 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 getting, we're getting into those, eh? But I want us to just go back briefly when you said you diagnosed yourself with dyslexia. Yeah. 
So at what age was this? Uh, I think I was in my early 20s when I, because I was, I, I had gotten past the insecurity of teenagehood where you just think you're stupid. Yeah. You, you know you what I mean? Stupid. I'm not yeah. stupid, yeah. you know, but I called myself stupid for very, very, very many years. I you can know? only imagine because it had, these are two decades of your life. Yeah. Not knowing what you're going through. Right. But being judged by everyone around you. Right. Because it happens. Really. And it's and it's not like I failed yeah. anything. Like I, I, you know, probably got like 80, 85 out of 100. Like, you know what I mean? Like yeah. it wasn't like I was sh- stupid, but I just didn't think I was as smart as someone who was, like my brother is a super genius. He's probably got, well, I don't know, we don't know what he has, but he's like got this brain that is like, he's a coder, He. He's, you know, plays classical piano, that kind of stuff. And so he would like sit on the couch and come back with 99. <laughs> and I'd work my ass off and come back with 85. 85 ain't bad. Mm-hmm. 85 is still like but top he got, he third. Got 99 after sitting the whole day. Right, exactly. So I was thinking, well, this isn't as easy for me. You know what I mean? And I, I always went into things knowing that it wouldn't come to me. I would have to work for it. Mm-hmm. Right. Which in the end has probably done me very well yeah. because I I don't take a lot of that stuff lightly. But, like, it's – you you do go through a long, long, long period of time where you're just like, I'm just not that smart. I'm just not that smart. And then when you get out of that insecurity of looking at everyone or looking at the system even – and I think that this is where the system fails kids, yeah. right, is that if you do not recognise that – a kid needs to learn in a different way, they will always fail the test that you put in front of them. Yeah. Always, yeah? But if you can take time and change the way that you... Like, if you can actually look at the kid and and say, oh, no, no, this isn't a stupid kid, yeah. but this is um, a kid that just needs a different way. Like, like, for instance, I am a great writer. I can't edit. Mm. I'm a great writer. I can't edit. So I wrote a book. But when I was in year nine, or S3 as you call it here, a teacher looked at me and said, if there was you not... You wrote a textbook? I, I wrote a novel. You wrote a novel? Yeah, I haven't published it. By so your student there. senior, okay, year nine, senior three. Yeah, senior three that's teacher a, was that, like... That's impressive though. I wasn't in year nine. I was, I was, it was about a few years back, mm. right? I did this um, ridiculous trip where I travelled from Australia to Europe without flying. That's a story for another day. Yeah. But um, so I wrote a book about it. But my year, I remember my year nine teacher sitting me down and saying to me, if there was not a verbal part of this course, I would have had to fail you. You are not a good writer. Yeah. But then I went on to write my own, like have my yeah. own book. Your own book, yeah. My own magazine. I, you know what I yeah. mean? And so it's those kind of things. But if you tell a 13, 14, 15 year old, you are not a good writer. They will carry that with them. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? But the way that I see and look at things means that I'm actually an exciting writer because I can draw, I can liken a person to a bird instead of likening a person to a person. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And make it work because I see the connections. The visual imagery. Right. Yeah. So it's, um, the, it, there's a big problem that schools, even in Australia, like this is not like, doing differentiated learning has only started you know and because i'm i'm an online online um learning designer yeah. so now you're getting you know how do you engage kids online everyone's in their house blah blah yeah. blah so they have to look at learning differently they have to because if you can't stand in front of a child and teach them what they need to know then you have to start teaching the syllabus in a different way but that should be Online, that should be face-to-face. That should be in everything because there are a lot of kids that are falling through the cracks. And, like, I I remember when I was, like, kind of more at ease with having, like, dyslexia and then you start – because with every every, um, defect, there's an asset. Yeah. In life, yeah. it's it is the rule of the game, and so a lot of people get these diagnoses, and they're like, "That's it, I'm a loser." That, that. Yeah. And for me, I'm like, "Ah, what's Let, letting the label define you?" Right, yeah. but then it's like, "What is my superpower?" Yeah. And like, I literally can go into meetings now, and and people usually see me, and they're like, "This chick," and then I talk to them for thirty minutes, and they go, "How did she even?" 
come, come like up with how did she come up with that right and so i know that none the add and the dyslexia i do not think that i will be a, would be able to do what i do now if you did if i didn't you. have it no but um it also comes with of course right yeah. do you know what i mean so like dyslexics are more uh not dyslexics people with add are more likely to rage right so you will see <laughs> I have a saying that I tell everyone who gets to know me well is that my anger burns hot and fast, yeah. right? And so sometimes when I'm with people, there's there's some things that come up um, that I cannot control. And you just give it And then, poor, there's like a there. fire sweep through yeah. the place. And then I usually will, A, apologize because I'm an adult and yeah. I know what my repercussions are, yeah. and B, um, try and... St- sort the situation out calmly or I will walk away. Like you will often find that I will be silent because I do not know what will come out of my mouth. These are all of the things that you have to learn. So you learn the pluses so that you don't feel like you're a failure and then you mitigate the minuses, which is like, okay, if you know that you're likely to rage or if you know that you're going to get overwhelmed if you're with people too much, how do you create your own space? Which has been interesting being in Uganda. With my four children. And plus, you guys are never alone. Do you know? Like, you always you have... Man, always. <laughs> with people everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. I lived by myself. And people used to be like, you are very social. But I would go home to an empty house. And you know what I mean? I'd wake up in the morning and meditate in, and Australia. in Australia. Yeah. I, you can't do that here. Wee, mama. But you try. I see you. I, I, saw you I in the morning. try. You try I try. I do walks. Um... I sometimes lock myself up in my room. I probably seem like I'm rude at some stages, and sometimes even at social functions, yeah. you I you will find that I will leave, even if it's at my own house. You leave your own house. I no, I will leave the the like the sitting room, room yeah. and go into my bedroom yeah. and chill out because yeah. it is o- overwhelming and it's constant and it's there's something that's really good about it, and there's something that it's that I've. I've also found, yeah, very hard to cope with, you know, because I didn't realize how much of that time that I needed by myself yeah. in order to level out, yeah. you know. So I have a question. Growing up for these two decades, mm. was, that's where I have some keen interest. Dyslexics are usually, they are more predisposed to depression, mm. anxiety, mm-hmm. majorly Mental health, their mental health is not in the right state. Mm-hmm. So did you have a very strong enough foundation, let me say from family, from school? Okay, school, we've, we've gotten a picture, mm. but the support from the family. Were your parents ever, other people around you, were they ever, you're doing this wrong, you're... I think everyone gets that. Do you know what I mean? And you're hypersensitive when you're growing up. And I'm hypersensitive anyway. Yeah, and with, so this is already from an ordinary perspective, an mm. ordinary setting. Like this is an ordinary child yeah. who they're going to talk to in this manner, they're going to farm or they're going to... But I can only imagine for you, some things had some overkill to them. Um, yeah, and, st- and still do. Yeah, still uh, do. And still do, yeah. Like, I think that the the process of growing up is, is really an adventure of finding your own toolbox. Yeah. And, um, and I talk to a lot of people about that because I have had to battle with a whole range of stuff because, uh, well, of anything, life happens, mm. right? Um, but I think that uh, when I was at school, I was probably just, like, considered the good naughty child. Like, she will, you know, she'll mm. do some funny stuff and she'll be the class clown, but she'll always get her work done. Mm. And so, so there was that line. Like, I've always kind of towed the line, yeah. so I never kind you, of... You masqueraded through the system. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, but that's just me. Like, yeah. I take pride in my work. I yeah. take pride in the quality of stuff that I do. Yeah. Um, and I'm really, really... Um, I don't like letting people down yeah. because I don't actually see it as letting them down. I see it as you letting me down. down. Yeah. yeah. Like, I think that there's, like, this Bible verse that I... That stuck in my head when I was very, very young, which is let your yeses be yes and your noes be no, you know. you It's this thing of like, I want to be a woman of my word and I want for people to walk away 
and I, I'm proud of what I've given them and they're happy at, at what yeah. they've gotten. And that was even in school. But first, I think that was, it helps you build commitment first to yourself right. before you could commit to others. And, no, that, that mine was the opposite. I'm using my mind. Your <laughs> mind? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, you're, you're, you're less of a people pleaser than I am. Yeah, okay, I, yeah. I, I have done a lot of things because I cannot handle people feeling ill of me. Was that, does it come from the need to fill in, to, to fit in? Um, I, yeah. I mean, we, we are also not discussing the added complexity of being the only black kid in my school for the, well, my class. Let's say 15 years of your life. For, for all of my school year, I was the only black girl in my, so you are already standing out. Yeah. And so there's that just don't stand out anymore. Do you know what I mean? Like just. So you had you tried to fit in as much. As yeah, you but you don't know that. You know, yeah, yeah, like we call it assimilation yeah. in Australia, where you. In the world, actually, don't say in Australia. It's in the world, yeah. but but assimilation yeah. is not is is on a different level here, yeah. right? So a lot of people want go into a situation knowing that they want to fit in, and so mimic or try and adopt things so that you're not you don't stand out as much yeah. in australia i grew up with obviously the unconscious knowing of i'm a black kid yeah. and then the conscious knowing like you know racism kind of was in my face by the time i was six knowing that i was different and then you know like parents doing things differently hair doesn't go down, it yeah. goes up, you know, that kind of thing. And so you don't even know that you're doing it. And I think that I got into, you know, later on in life and I realized how much I had assimilated without knowing, yeah. you know. Um, and so... So there was, I, I, I'm starting to feel there was a sense of loneliness when you're growing up? No. Not, not necessarily. I mean, I mean, if there were other black people around, like there were other black people around in family settings. You, because I, I assume the population of blacks in Australia is, is so you you basically know yourselves. Yes. Yes. So yes. I'm, to, I'm talking about minus that setting of in your home where all black. This is family. I mean, like really friends that, you know. But you can't miss KFC if you've never tasted it. That's true. So in context. So in context, <laughs> yeah. in context is that that was my my. Yeah, you, you can't miss something you didn't have. You, yeah, yeah, you, you, you didn't have it. Yeah. Yeah, it so was never So you were subconsciously, there. you may not have noticed the loneliness. Right. But now from. Yes, if, if from hindsight. Yeah, from hindsight. Oh my god, I'm that's that counseling. This is this is a dyslexic black. <laughs> yeah. Child in a foreign country. Yeah. That's crazy. It's crazy. That's really. Crazy. It's crazy. It's yeah. crazy because. Um, I mean, if you're talking about um, mental health, uh, as I fear sometimes, I'm not so much anymore because it's changing, yeah. but I used to fear like bringing up black kids in a white world yeah. because like I wasn't dated. So like I had my first boyfriend was when I came to Uganda and my second boyfriend <laughs> was like in my 20s, right? And I don't <laughs> and so yeah. so as like it's really weird where you grow up and you're like i know i'm pretty i think i'm pretty i don't think i'm pretty because no one wants to date me but yeah. i think i am because they like me and uh, you know like and so you have but this, you never like, really get the adverses the full-blown right yeah. never so like prom. so no, well yeah no but i was you know i'm funny i'm funny and i made friends yeah. and so i it's like i went to i went to all the things i yeah. never missed out on anything yeah. except for you know the kissing and stuff you know which um is which warps you as a woman you get what i mean like it warps the way that you interact with men as as you grow older and stuff like that and all of that stuff i've had so to unlearn. yeah yeah massively you know and um and i had to unlearn it yeah. i had to unlearn it like slowly 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 so ADHD and dyslexia mm. are more or less genetic. Okay, not genetic, but there's that's the most yeah. correlation. I they, think they give. So, I think so, but I don't know who has it. I think maybe my mom. Your mom. Maybe. Uh, but smile, it goes unnoticed. 
Yeah, I mean, she grew up here, like, you know. Mm-hmm. She used to have her on the show because she's dyslexic in Uganda. Yeah. That would be a, a, I don't I haven't heard of a dyslexic in Uganda though. Though yeah, I know they are there. there. I know they are there, but I mean because this is the essence of the show. Yeah, what and that is the sad awareness. thing yeah. is that there was a lot of people that like I'll look at them and I'll be like, Whoo, yep, you've got this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because I mean, when when you're growing up and you're going through most of this stuff comes out and all of this stuff comes out when you're stressed, yeah. right? So you have it in the background. You're like, oh, I go a little bit too fast. Yeah. Oh, I crash sometimes. Oh, I can't read that or I can't concentrate. But until it becomes a problem, you survive around it, yeah. right? Um, and so, but usually by the time it becomes a problem, the way that it displays itself also has elements of anxiety, yeah. elements of depression, elements. So I've had to do a lot of research because I'm one of those people that likes to fix things. Yeah. I have done a lot of research on that. So I can spot some, some stuff that's so flying around. Yourself. Yeah, well, you Basically, have to. You, because if you, okay, the fact that you try to fix yourself still brings up the back the the question of empowerment. Yes. Did you ever go for therapy, counseling? All of it. I'm saying before ADHD. Because All of it. There's the dyslexia that you had for your first two decades. Mm. So when did you start going for therapy? Like yeah. as soon as I got money. As soon as you got money. So this yeah. was after school. Yeah. That's still a very long time, though. No? Uh, I, I think we had free counseling. We have free counseling services in uni. I dropped in and out of that. But like at that point in time, um, I was drinking as counseling. So that was We're getting <laughs> brilliant. We're getting that, yeah. yeah. But but that's why that, that would have stalled. But then you get to a space where you're like, no, this is not, this is not um, feasible. Yeah. You're right. And I'm an adult. So it's, I can't just so the tell. So therapy really helps. Um, it's empowered you. It gave you the knowledge and tools. No, it gave me some tools, you but not all you. tools. The rest is up to you. No, well, I, I wouldn't say I would steer away from uh, saying therapy as a solution for everything. You know, I think I got a lot of help from church. I think I got a lot of help from... Um, uh, t- weird places. TikTok. There's a guy on TikTok that um, does a speech. I, I wish I had saved it. But he did a speech about how uh, dyslexia and ADD are superpowers. And there are a few, like, TED Talks out there as well. TED Talks are amazing. Um, that that show, like, how your, your um, what you may think is a ne- of a negative is – a positive like people with depression they go oh my god i like am prone to sadness but most of the time they're also prone to feeling happiness in different kinds of ways do you know what i mean and so and they're more empathetic they can read people's emotions they are more humble and they can be there for people they're more forgiving like there is these positives that come with everything but i don't think that counseling is a one-stop solution do you know what i mean Um, I've read books. I've read self-help books. I have listened to, like, motivational speakers every morning. I have done meditations. I have prayed. I have done – I like, I mean, I will do anything. You have tested. Yeah. yeah. And I picked up the bits that I've loved Mm. and I've left the rest, you know. Mm. And I I was in one of these – like, I've gone to groups for Mm. different things. I had to go to a group for my drinking. And so – yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and that's what they say there. They say take take what you like and leave the rest. Yeah. And so I don't do it anymore, but I I did it for a, a long, long time. Yeah. And so they taught me a lot of stuff because a lot of this stuff is like the knowledge of it is not enough, right? It's not burdensome. You, you know, there's there's a the flip side to having knowledge. It's no, it's not even burdensome. Is that sometimes it doesn't show you how to do life. Right? So you if you go, I'm prone to rage, I'm like, well, that's good to know. Mm-hmm. Now, every time I get ragey, I'm prone to rage. How do you stop raging? Inside out, I think. There's, there's tools. Inside you out. Know? It starts from so, the inside. Mm, journaling. Yeah. Take a shower. Mm-hmm. 
because sometimes it all of these emotions are physical right so sometimes you have to reset because your muscles tense and whatever if you take a shower it relaxes all your muscles you'll actually be able to let go think go for a walk do some writing yeah. listen to happy songs L- listen to sad songs and cry like give yourself a time limit under your doona yeah. like these are all of the things you know like if someone is be- like hounding you people were like you're allowed to say i don't know right now i'll get back to you yeah. so moving on 40 percent of the people these are treated for addictions mm. have a learning disorder especially in the mm-hmm. developed worlds because mm-hmm. naturally you they're more predisposed i mean people who go through traumatic experiences as children mm-hmm. the genetic predisposition to addiction and all those mm. things so people with your condition are also more susceptible to what mm-hmm. falling prey to you know the life of addiction mm-hmm. so in australia you used to do music you used to do yeah. shows i mean you're basically around substances and alcohol 21st mm. i remember you telling us actually your, the current part of the current was what yeah was beer. Yeah, yeah yeah so how and the fact that you you needed the assimilation the fact that you the over need to fit in mm. you may not have noticed it but i believe now you were down a path that at some point you actually had no control over mm. mm-hmm. so how did the addiction start like and where did it accumulate into um i had I was always prone to it. So we started, we, I look at my kids now yeah. and I'm like, my son is 15 and I was like, at your age, oh, what, what you I was drunk. <laughs> like, he, like he's like such an angel. Like people are like, oh, they shouldn't be acting like this. I was like, you don't know. Yeah. Like in Australia, they drink a lot more. So like chill. I know yeah. that like that's a like faux pas in, in um, Uganda, but in Australia, it was we started drinking at fifteen. We like you drinking. all just come together, fifteen. Yeah, start everyone steals pushing. alcohol from their parents' yeah. cupboards. Yeah. You meet in a park. It was totally unsafe and yeah. really stupid, but um, most of us survived it, yeah. you know. Um, and then you know, then I had a, a, a very big event that happened that was kind of traumatic, and I started drinking every day. And that's when it started it, when I was like 19. Do you want to talk about the experience? Hells no. Hell no. <laughs> Hell no. But it was, it was just enough to, because sh- I was 19 at the time, it was enough to just shake my world. Do yeah. you know what I mean? Like everything that I, I held on to just d- dissolved. Yeah. Um, and so I drank morning to night with a friend of mine. Yeah. And then I got into the music industry. So my drinking wasn't because of the music it wasn't even because of the experience it was just i'm predisposed to it and as i said before if i find something that will make me feel good i will do it until i run it into the ground the The compulsion yes uh, right and add has massive compulsion things like you know um I gave up drinking and I said that I was never going to drink again and I haven't drunk for a very, 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 very long time. Yeah. Very, very long time. And and I and I hope to God that I won't because I know that the it can be fine for a few years and then... Till it's not. Till it's not, yeah. you know what I mean? Um, and so I, and I was really young when I gave up. I was in my early, early 20s. And so it was still okay to be a mess, <laughs> you know, like no, in your twenties, yeah, yeah, yeah. you're yeah, like de- mm, stumbling around half yeah. drunk in the middle of the day is like, ah, oh, uni students, yeah. look at them. And, but like, um, I kind of was like, I'm not going to be able to the, like, thank God, you know, thank God. It happened that, when you did. Yeah. 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 Because you, I knew that I wasn't going to be able to see my future. And a lot of my friends who I still keep in contact with but have had to deal with that later on. Yeah. And it's been more challenging because you've got more to lose, you know. Like you, you have careers to lose. You have partners. You've got kids. You've got all of that stuff. Whereas, like, I just, you know, had to get You my, looked into the back pay that if this is what I'm doing now. Yeah. I can't picture myself. No. Yeah. And there's something that, like, I've been blessed with, which is enough foresight or understanding of myself 
that um, that I could know that it was a problem because a lot of people have uh, self denial kind of but denial is the underlying factor of addiction right just being in denial right it's not that bad yeah. uh, it won't happen this time I you know like all of that stuff so I don't have a problem it's them like they're just not fun you know and I did that for a few years. Um, you know, they call it downgrading your friends <laughs> where you're like, you just drink with people who drink more and more and more than you. And then you realize that, you know, you have had a private education and you are from a middle income family and yeah. you're hanging out with people that are semi homeless, which I also thank God for, yeah. you know, because, yeah, because I can see homeless people and see myself like from the bottom of my heart see homeless people and see myself like they do not scare me they do not um you know they're not a faux pas to me because I know how close I was between you know like I've got great parents like my parents would never let me fall but I knew that if I did not have that the the trajectory that I was going in was so low that I would have nothing. You, you know, up right? Yeah. And so there is no way that I can look at someone who is walking around the streets crazy, you know. Because when I was, <laughs> God, this is deep. But when I was drinking, I used to hang out with those people because their mind space and my mind space were the same. Yeah. You know, I may have like gotten off the side of the curb and walked into an office, yeah. but we were sharing the same demons. Yeah. You know. And so, um, and and the beautiful thing about that is that, like, difficult people I give more space to. Like, I don't need everyone to act right. It doesn't mean I don't get annoyed, <laughs> but I don't need everyone to act right all the time. I need them to act with kindness most of the time, but I can see that sometimes people are dealing with a lot more than what it looks like on yeah. the outside, you know? Um, and so, so yeah, every cloud has a silver lining, I guess they say. Yeah. I don't know. But, um, yeah, it's, I don't know, it's a very big process. So I got stuck in it for a few years and then recovering from it was a few know, years, right? Yeah. And so I felt like I lost chunks of my life yeah I felt like I lost a really really big chunk of my life because once you stop uh drinking you have to start learning how to deal with emotions sober (laughs) right the real way sucks yeah it's it's different you're learning how to live yeah like a normal person now exactly now, but it's, it's not, not a normal, normal person no, I'm saying like because well, people when addicted, drink when you're addicted okay when you're intoxicated yeah for so long how yeah. it becomes the new sober right so when you try to flip the coin right. living a sober life is now abnormal to you it's abnormal yes and it's but it's abnormal to everyone like you there are friends of mine that do not have drinking problems but I'm like mental health issues. no no right. mental health right. issues but you try and get them to not drink for a month mm. Not it's, drink for a month. Yeah, it's very difficult so for most people. No, because you see, if you, because if you can go to a party, yeah. and you can drink, and then for the next week you don't drink or whatever, and that's okay. It's that's, okay. That's, uh, not, but most mark my words though, it's not okay. Oh, we, yeah. we do not condone. No, yeah. but but no. Also, the thing is, is that you you have to realize that if it's not a problem to you, it's not a problem. So I will not vilify. Anything. Why fix something that's not broken? Well, I will not vilify anything that is is not a problem for you. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, like, when I got sober, all my friends were still raging drunk. Parties were happening all the time. It was fine to go out yeah. till 5 o'clock in the morning and then the next day and whatever. Yeah. We were t- in our 20s. I was like, I am never going to judge you for something that is my problem. Yeah. You know what I mean? So there is nothing wrong with alcohol if you if it is not ruining your life. If you wake up in the morning and think about it, if you're drinking by yourself, if it's ruining your friendships, there's a whole list. There's yeah. a you just go into the yeah. AA website. There's a so questionnaire. For, how long were you drinking? It was fifteen um, to less twenties? I think I was no, I was 
to my early 20s. So, like, I think I was alcoholically drinking for about four years. Four years. But, like, drinking. Or, or binge drinking. Yeah, or heavy like, drinking. Yeah. like, every day, every day, every day drinking. So, was it just alcohol? Yeah, I, well, I mean, I smoke cigarettes. I still okay, smoke. Okay, alcohol, cigarettes go. Um, alcohol. But I have never really been which I thank God for, mm. <laughs> really into any hard drugs, mm. you know, because I, with with me knowing me, and there's also some things that I won't touch. Mm. Like if someone came up to me and goes, do you want to try this? I'm like, let's look at the evidence. Yeah. Is it a good idea? Mm-mm, mm-mm. Mm. But like all of that, because like, in Australia also it is more prevalent, you know, like it might not be here, but it was when I was growing up mm. and in the industry that I was in, you know, but I just never really took to it. I yeah. like, I loved alcohol. You know what I mean? And mm. that's also why I won't go back. Cause I still probably have a really sick love affair with the, yeah. the whole thing. So I'm like, if I know that if I love something, I want to do it for as much as I can. Like, let's just have a breakup Actually, and never see each other I'm again. <laughs> right. I'm basically telling you, you have to let go of the thing you love the most. The most, right? Because, because it was my I friend. Mean, I didn't even need to hang out with people. Yeah. I'm like, I'm hilarious when yeah. I'm drunk to myself. Yeah. Probably not others. <laughs> but like, I'm my best friend. Yeah. Um, and so, but yeah, uh, dealing with those emotions. And the worst thing, of, not the worst thing, but the most intriguing thing that they don't tell you when you get sober, you think that drinking is your problem. But you're drinking your problems. Yeah, you're right? underlining issues. Right. Yeah. So as soon as you stop drinking, you're like, look at me. I know. Oh my God, my problems. Yeah. You know? And so that's when I started really taking seriously mental health um, because it came up with a lot of um, things that I had to sort through. Because yeah. you do crappy things when you're drunk all the time. You do really, really crap. You know, only you know how bad it is. Right. <laughs> yeah. right. yeah. You do really, really like. You. you you stop being yourself. You cross so many lines. Right. Actually, there are no more lines. It's really insanity. It's, People it's insanity. It's really insanity. And it's like, you know, those times where you like, you lie to your parents or you manipulate them mm. or you, you do things that you, you just are out of character and you don't like yourself because you haven't been doing likable things, you know? And the one thing that, and this is why I say like that program taught me a lot because, um, it taught me things like esteemable acts, which I'd never heard of, right? And they're like, if you feel bad about yourself, go do something for somebody else that is nice. Yeah. You will feel better about yourself. And so you it's start... It's a bit selfish, but... But all of it is. Yeah, everything. There is no such thing as yeah. true generosity. Even People a mother's love th- comes... No! Condition. Oh, God! Mother's love's the worst. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> Like, that has so many terms, conditions, like, small text, like, if you become a lawyer, if you get married, if you give me grandbabies, if you, you know, don't shame my name, that the mother, you just put the mother's love there. It's constant, but it has the most conditions yeah. that you possibly can have, right? It feels so good to me. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, I also see it yeah. with my children. Like, I'm like... I, I was like, I'm going to be one of those people, like, live and let live. And then this morning, was I screaming at the top of the, my my lungs for Kathy to are. stop? Yeah, right? Yeah. You know? I'm like, okay, I'm not. Yeah. I'm not as, like that. So it's all of it. Like, people think that generosity is something that you, um, it means giving of yourself. And yes, it does. But um, you you are getting something out of it. And because I'm so meta and I deep dive into stuff, I sometimes don't like doing things if I feel like, like if I tell the story a lot, I'm like, you're getting something out of it. You're getting something out of it. And so at one point in time, I stopped telling my kids stories because I was like, are you making yourself feel better because you're taking yeah. care of the kid. You know what I mean? Like, you're sens- sensationalizing it. Yes, it, it's already a sensational story. Yeah. Like, it's an absolute fucking cork over story. But I'm like, are you getting something out of this? And so, like, for, I think I gave myself, like, three months where I just could not tell the story, right? And yeah. it, it's weird, but I do these little things for myself to make sure that I'm not being an asshole. You're doing a very <laughs> <laughs> but but for for instance, with my kids, yeah. it's like the amount of people that say, "Oh, thank you for looking after the kids, thank you," for, and I squirm 
because I know the amount of love that I get from those four children. Mm. And sure, they have changed my life. I mean, four. Dating is like, you're like, like, I have four kids. I didn't give birth, but like, you're trying to tell the whole story, right? But it's like a sieve, a very, very huge sieve, I mean, now. Right. We're getting into that. Oh my God. Like, actually having those kids, like adopting those kids have been the best thing for dating quality people. Because... Like, the shaft. Right? Yeah, like, yeah. people are like, fucking me. And I'm like, okay. Straight out the window. Right? Exactly. But how, how does that go? I mean, you walk up to, let's say, who? Mark. Be like, Mark is hitting on you. Mm. He wants to pull through and you, tell, you have to first inform him that you have four adopted Oh, yeah. Children. I do it straight away. Yeah. So, four adopted children. How did you come up with this whole concept? Because, I mean, even I want to adopt in the future. Yeah. But how did you come up with this? Were you married once? Did you try having children of your own? Oh, oh deep question. We, we, we just deep dove there. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, <laughs> <laughs> you, you guys are like just like trying to get to know all the grid. <laughs> yeah? Hey, is that why you invited me on? And actually, because I really like hanging with you on the <laughs> So this one I actually really, really reserved. Because you just want to be as honest as you can. <laughs> as raw as you can be. Because I don't think you'll ever tell anyone else why you were married or not married. But. Um, I was married. I was married for... I was with him for five years. Five years. Five years. Um, that's the reason why I <laughs> went from Australia to uh, Europe without flying. And along the way, we met a lot of really nice racists. And... Um, we don't i don't think that we were prepared to be a mixed race couple yeah so um the the marriage ended because i i couldn't see a future and and it, now i look back on it and it was the most pain i had experienced because i had not really connected with my blackness for a very very long time and then people were hating me for it like would not serve me, spit, spitting at me, screaming at me, blah, blah. And I felt... Spitting at you? Yeah. In the face? Yeah. Well, not face. But on the... Huh? Right, yeah. So, I mean, I went through Russia and China. Like, I mean, it wasn't like I went... I went through the... Not the most yeah. black-friendly places, yeah? yeah. And, um, and I don't think that he expected that... And so, especially in like somewhere by... What did he expect? The race? Uh, we... He didn't expect the world to judge you the way yeah. he saw you. And then, and then the commitment to that, you know, like we weren't... Like mixed race couples can work if they are racially aware. So if you know that you are now... You can no longer see yourself or take any white privilege at all you are pretty much on the black game and you have to be a protector to that person when they are in hostile territory and so we he continued to act like we were in melbourne he was indifferent (laughs) not indifferent like he saw that it was but like he didn't stand up for you yeah because he he never had to yeah. We weren't in a we that wasn't what our relationship was yeah. ever built on, right? And so when you are the only black person in Wherever a hostile yeah. environment and the person that you're with doesn't own you as much, you feel alone, yeah. right? Um and so but the thing is is that if you have children they're gonna be black. <laughs> Doesn't matter if you have children with a white person. Was he white? Mixed, was, yeah, was, he was, was he, was, yeah, he Australian? was Serbian, Serbian Australian. Serbian. So um, so you, I, I then realized that he wasn't racially aware, and I wasn't racially aware. So I cannot blame all of this on yeah. him. Um, I wasn't racially aware, and so. Having children means that you can actually do damage. There was a lot of damage that was done for me growing up in Australia and my parents not growing up in Australia yeah. because they didn't grow up with racism. And when you are from a country where everyone is, the majority of the country is black, yeah. 
you grow up with a sense of knowing yourself not as a freak. That's the lightest way I can yeah. say it. And so when people are like, where are you from, blah, 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 you can look at them and go, are you crazy? Like there's a whole place over there where this is not a problem, yeah. right? Whereas when we were growing up, they didn't realize that we were dealing with this is a problem yeah. every day of our lives, yeah. right? And so my parents were amazing, but they, they didn't teach us Luganda because they wanted us to be invo- like more uh, belonging in Australia, hence the accent, it, yeah. yeah, but then didn't realize that that was actually disconnecting us from everything that could give us peace, yeah. right? And so you... Uh, you then, um, you then, if you then marry someone who isn't racially aware and you have children, there was a lot of, well, they just haven't seen a black person before. That's not comforting to me. Yeah. Right? I still got screamed at. Yeah. You know, I still got disregarded. I did that, that is not comfort. And you can, you can, do damage without knowing that you're doing damage if you raise, you know, it's very hard for, uh, if we go for basics, it's very hard for a a woman to raise a man and have that man, that boy have all of the qualities that he needs to have. And so there are, especially with my son, there are times where I deflect to the men in my life because I'm like, you need to teach him. He needs a father figure. He needs a father figure, right? Um, just like a, a white man cannot raise a black man. Yeah. So that's one of the reasons why you didn't get to teach. I, I couldn't. You couldn't? I couldn't. For him or? Well, I mean, I, I think that I saw how unprotected I felt. Around him. And then, yeah. yeah. And it's not... He's a good guy. Yeah. He's a good guy. And I, it was um, interesting because we stayed together for six months after we decided to separate because we didn't want to walk away hating each other. And, um, and we had this conversation which was like, if we had not gone on this crazy-ass trip, we would be living the Melbourne life drinking coffees. Well, you didn't drink coffee, yeah. iced coffee. But, you know, like, like with our kids yeah. and be chill. But um, the trip taught you a lot. Yeah, the trip. So you the whole trip was for five years. No, the whole the whole trip was eight months. Eight months. Yeah, and so then we stayed in. Uh, we had backpacks, but um, I I don't don't backpack. But it was fun. I think it, it must have been fun though. I've seen my my passport is nearly full. How many I have countries? S- uh, way too many. Way too many. Way oh. too many. Because we had to go from. Melbourne, Singapore, Singapore, Vietnam, Vietnam, Hong Kong, Hong Kong, Beijing, Beijing, Mongolia, Alambata. Uh, then we went to uh, St. Petersburg in Russia. No, we went to Moscow, St. Petersburg. Then we went to Finland, Estonia. Like, like I've done... Europe. I've done Europe, you know. I've seen a lot of things. And, I like, I'm not saying that all of it was horrible. Um, I, I always wanted to go to China. I wish I was more racially aware that they and they sometimes not your... nice to black people. Yeah. But, I mean, I I was obsessed with communism at yeah. one stage, blah, blah, blah. So it was good. Um, and, and I even think that if I had stayed with him, I wouldn't have come back to Uganda. So it, I mean, it is wouldn't have this pleasure yeah exactly yeah, so, so exactly so <laughs> cheers to him yeah. but also like i mean so so we were not we were not ready to have kids at that point in time because yeah. we were moving our whole lives and so we were waiting to settle down and then we got divorced and i went back to australia because i couldn't stay in belgium yeah. i love belgium any if you want to go just go to belgium it's fucking not all of Belgium. Ah, go to Brussels. Just go to Brussels. It's like it's lovely. It's amazing. It's yeah. so multicultural. And I had I had spent so long um being the only black in the village that by the time I got to like Paris, I was like, oh my god, black people again. This is amazing. And then there was this one moment where we were. He's 
his family, some of his family stay in just outside of um, Brussels. And so he stayed in Brussels and we went into this um, mall and I looked around and everyone was black. And I was like... Oh. You felt at home. Right? Yeah. I felt relieved. I felt safe, yeah. you know. Um, and so they've got a really um, mixed population there, but they've also got art and whatever. Yeah. It's a beautiful place. Um, and so I came back to Australia and you don't get – it's not like dating. Like I can date someone and and you can move on pretty quickly, but marriage is – it's different. It's different. Yeah. Divorces. Yeah. yeah, you know, because I stood up in front of all of my friends and I said, this one for life, for life, you know. And then I came back and I had to rebuild. And on top of that, I had all gone through the whole big racist um, thing of the travel. Yeah. And so I came back and my friends were like you you're racially angry <laughs> why can't we say all the stuff that we used to say so um so that took a few years um so I I can have kids and I want to have kids but somewhere along the lines my cousin told us about a lady who was sick and her kids were not studying and as you can see about education and passionate I was like that can't happen yeah. so I was gonna help her from Australia, just put her kids in school and get someone to help her with her um, illness. And then I was gonna shriek, get out, yeah. you know, and um, and she died. So my kids lost their mum and they were gonna separate them uh, all and I couldn't let that happen. They were so young, yeah. you know? And so we've just kind of tried to make this really weird family, you know, um, that has probably made me more responsible and made me more happy and um, and also stressed me out and also... Well, that's really, really that. lovely, though. I mean, that's I didn't expect that version of the story. Really? But, but now that I get the version, it's really, really touching. I mean, from the heart, it's really, really something nice, really beautiful. Yeah, we're, we're happy. We yeah. try. And I try to get them to remember their mom because... I don't believe in taking someone's place. I believe yeah. in adding on to a legacy. Yeah. And they were greatly loved. And I know they were greatly loved because they greatly love me. Yeah. Kids can't express what they've never been shown, yeah. you know. Um, and so I just I just add on to that. And and with dating, it just means that it seals out the crap. <laughs> you get to know the serious okay. people out there. So my, my people, my good people, mm -hmm. very attractive young lady ah! here with four children so if ever yeah. if ever you have something to say i mean just hit me up and we we, we hook it up yeah this was supposed to be an appetizer <laughs> so please, but lastly please. lastly as we were finishing this yeah um as we're sharing sometime you you told me one of your fears is your daughter mm -hmm. last born mate actually be dyslexic yeah and ADD. And ADD. Because cool. we've seen the way she, oh. she talks with us. I mean, she's fearless, she's bold, she's, she's very sh intelligent for very, her age. Yes. But... She can't now, read. Now, you who knows the fact that she can't read, I mean, the world is smallest because these are adopted children. Mm. Not even of your blood, but yeah. one of them is already showing signs of being what? Yeah. Dyslexic. So, how best do you think you're going to help her cope? Because now you have a more mature understanding you know the forms of education that can best benefit her. So how best do you think she's going to be able to fit into our Ugandan system? I, I, I'm, I fear that she might not be able to. And for all the dyslex dyslexic children born in Uganda and third world countries, how do you think we can create facilities and structures that can help them better their lives? Um, For me, with the dyslexia, I had to learn myself, yeah. you know, and it, it will be easier. There are certain things that she, I think that going through like P1 and 2, they will teach her how to do the basics. Yeah. And then when she gets to a level of understanding, I'll be able to sit down with her and kind of. Restructure. Yeah. Restructure or give her, to, it's, it's not even restructuring. It's just giving her tools. Yeah. It's like, why don't you use that? pink pencil yeah. to highlight what you think is important. You know, like all of those things that I've had to learn um, along the way. There's a lot of um, online stuff 
Um, but it's uh, and then it might be just looking at um, international schools that have differentiated learning. Yeah. It's difficult because with anything that's specialized, it does take money or extra resources. The is you have the money and you, we're going to make How the do you money know? for you. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to make you the money. Yeah, so. right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. But, that, but that's the thing. It's yeah. like uh, with people who... But, but then again, I think that there's a lot of people that just do not do research. Yeah. You know, like Google can tell you pretty much anything Anything, these days do you know what i mean and so i think that there's certain things that i will have to teach her but there's also certain things that i will have to unteach her because i have a feeling that she will be told that she is stupid for a long period of time which she's like the brightest you know what i mean like she's this six-year-old that can jazz with adults comfortably it's crazy Comfortably, yeah. and you'll find yourself having an hour conversation with her, and you're like, "Wait a minute, six year old, <laughs> why, why am I telling you my life story? Yeah. This is not, you know, like she is an intelligent, bright superstar, you know." Um, and so I think that I will have to spend a lot of time um, uh, unlearning stuff. But also, Kathy doesn't take things on like you, like you can like her brothers and sisters like can abuse her and she'll be like she doesn't she Take doesn't ho- no yeah. god no she just it's water off the duck's yeah. back and so for her i think i look at her and her resilience and her you know um and i think she'll be okay yeah but these are the things that you have to kind of learn as you go along yeah. you know and at the moment i'm I've only been looking after them for a year full time, so I'm still learning how to do mom. Yeah, <laughs> you know, so, and so children at all. Right. Four, exactly. It's crazy. But yeah. we will learn as as we go. And the lucky thing is is that we're together. So yeah. I know I can see that. And it's been beautiful having them at home because yeah. even my other kids, because they were looking after their mum while she was dying. So they've missed out on years of school. Yeah. And so it's been interesting seeing how they learn and you know, it's not just dyslexia. I think that every every parent should have a personal vested interest in the, the education. Yeah, the ent- education and mental health. Yeah. But for me, with my kids, it's like I I don't I take pride in the explanation and not the answer. Yeah. If you can tell me why you did it and it's correct, it it means more than if you give me the right answer and it doesn't. Yeah. You know, and so I'm I'm trying to get my kids. To, because the one thing that saved me in all of this stuff, right, and this is not just education or whatever, is that that trying to find a solution and wanting to know why, you know, like if like someone was like, do you have, and there are some times where I've been like to doctors, I don't have that. Yeah. Why? Because I will Google, I will read, I will search for the answers, and I want my kids to have that yeah. because you don't need. A child, you're, I'm not going to be there forever. And I say this to my eldest. I'm like, me as a mother, I have only succeeded when you don't need me. If you can go out into the world and you can find solutions to your problems, you have the resiliency to get up. You know, something big won't come and you'll just lay over and die, but you'll pick yourself up and you'll keep going. If I can give you those, if I can give you a generous heart, you know, yeah. I, if I can give you um, the ability to give of yourself, then I've done my job, yeah. right? So it's not necessarily wanting to give her the solutions, but give her the tools that she can find the solutions to any of her problems. It's been a very, very, I'm, I'm so sad I have to cut this off because <laughs> I think we'll have to have you back. There's a lot. I want us to talk about racism. I want us to talk about so many things. But I think that will be for another time. Uh-huh. Hopefully you'll be with us. Yeah. So thank you very much for tuning in. It was, it's been a very lovely conversation with Eva. Hopefully you tune in next time. Subscribe, like, comment, all those things they do. Please do. And hopefully we'll get more inspiring stories. Thank you very much. Thank you. It numbs you, a nightmare, a horrible disease. These are just a few of the ways people have described mental illness in their lives. Whether it's you, your child, or a friend. Mental illness impacts all of us in the same ways, and that's why the Mind Space podcast is committed to uncovering mental illness and the impact it has.